Broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Nantan Lupan at the drive-in. Welcome to episode 26, Time Limit, 1957. We are following the Richard Widmark line from The Longships, 1964. This is a great little movie. I hadn't watched this movie in a couple of decades, and the last time I saw it was before I had ever seen The Manchurian Candidate, 1962. I was a little shocked in the similarities between the two, but I'll get into that after we go over the stars that are in this movie. This film was directed by Carl Malden. He was born in Chicago, but was raised in Gary, Indiana. Following high school, he spent three years working in a steel factory. He spent a short time at Arkansas State Teachers College before attending the Goodman Theater Dramatic School. Three years after he left the mill, he went to New York and found work on the stage. He served in World War II as a non-commissioned officer in the Army Air Corps. It was during this time that he was filmed for the movie Winged Victory, 1944. Following the war, he returned to Broadway and in the 1950s made a transition to films. In 1951, he won the Oscar for playing Stanley Kowalski's best friend in A Streetcar Named Desire, 1951. He shined as Father Corrigan in On the Waterfront, 1954, as the warden in Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962, opposite the great Burt Lancaster, as Captain Wessels in Cheyenne Autumn, 1964, which was directed by John Ford. Of course, Malden is probably best known as Detective Mike Stone from the Streets of San Francisco television show that ran from 1972 to 77. His partner was the son of Kirk Douglas, Michael. However, I remember him best for two military roles. First was Patton, 1972, where he was cast in the role of General Omar Bradley and played opposite George C. Scott as Patton. The second film is another, where he is cast with the star that he directs in this movie, Richard Widmark. The film, of course, is the hard-to-find Take the High Ground, 1953 where Malden and Widmark are drill instructors preparing raw recruits for the Korean War. Malden cast himself as one of the POWs in this movie, but he is very hard to pick out. Richard Widmark was cast in the role of Colonel William Edwards, a JAG officer investigator. I covered Widmark pretty thoroughly in episode 23, The Longships, 1964, so I will not add more here. Richard Basehart played Major Harry Cargill, the subject of Edwards' investigation. Basehart came to Hollywood in 1947 after a successful Broadway career. He made his mark on film noir with the gritty He Walked by Night, 1948. Basehart was a prolific talent with 112 movie and television credits. In 1956, he played Ishmael in Moby Dick, which starred Gregory Peck and was directed by John Huston. He is perhaps best known as Admiral Harriman Nelson, from the TV show Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, 1964-68. Dolores Michaels acted in the role of Corporal Gene Evans, an assistant to Edwards. Michaels was a Midwesterner whose father was a catcher for the Chicago Cubs. She was trained as a dancer and followed her sister into the traveling version of Brigadoon at age 16. She later moved to California and was discovered in a 20th Century Fox talent school. She had a 10-year career which included 10 movies. Her first credited role was The Wayward Bus, 1957. She was in Warlock, 1959, with Widmark and Henry Fonda. Her final movie was Battle at Bloody Beach, 1961. It is odd that early in her career she had a yo-yo weight problem because the first thing I noticed about her in Time Limit, 1957, is how small her waist was. I won't delve into this too much, as it is reported that when a reporter asked her for her measurements, she responded, you can go to the wardrobe department and find out. And I'm not a sex pot, I'm an actress. Michaels died at 68 in 2001. June Lockhart had a very small but important role as Mrs. Cargill. She was born in New York to an acting family. She started her stage work at 8 and had her first movie role as a teenager along with her parents in A Christmas Carol, 1938. Over the next 10 years, she made at least a dozen more movies before returning to the stage. In all, she had 169 movie and television roles. She is best known for her two television series, Lassie, which began in 1954, and Lost in Space, 1965. Carl Benton Reed played Lieutenant General Jay Connors, the commanding officer. He started acting on the stage in Cleveland and moved to Broadway, where he was very successful between 1929 and 49. 
1941, he was in his first movie, The Little Foxes. He made a lot of movies playing the stern authoritarian figure. Some of his greats include A Lonely Place 1950 with Bogart, The Command 1954, which I spoke about in episode 25, Broken Lance 1954 with Spencer Tracy, and Porkchop Hill 1959 with the great Gregory Peck. Reed followed these movies with a successful television career, mostly playing the same type. Martin Balsam played Sergeant Baker, the man with all the info. Balsam was born in the Bronx. He started acting in high school and continued while he was in college. When World War II broke out, Balsam joined. Following the war, he went to work at Radio City Music Hall and began studying at the Actors Studio under the direction of Elia Kazan and Lee Strasberg. He started working on Broadway in the late 40s and had a few small television roles. His big break came with On the Waterfront, 1954. His skills led to other vehicles such as 12 Angry Men, 1957 with Henry Fonda. Working on television in the mid-50s, he met the big man, Alfred Hitchcock. This meeting eventually landed Balsam in Psycho, 1960. Other 60s roles include Breakfast at Tiffany's, 1961. Kate Fear, 1962. The Carpetbaggers, 1964. A Thousand Clowns, 1965, where he won Best Supporting Actor. Tora, 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 1970, All the President's Men, 1976, and the totally forgettable St. Elmo's Fire, 1985. He moved to Italy and was in over a dozen Italian films. He died in Rome at the age of 76. Rip Torn played former POW Lieutenant George Miller. Damn, he was a handsome devil. I'm used to seeing him as Zed or as Patches O'Houlihan. Torn was a true-born Texan and attended Texas A&M and the University of Texas, majoring in animal husbandry. Hook 'em horns. As a young man, he hitchhiked to Hollywood for fame and fortune. This resulted in him working a lot of odd jobs until he got his first film part in Elia Kazan's Baby Doll, 1956. To work on his acting, he moved to New York and joined the actor's studio. Through the late 50s and early 60s, he worked on several important television shows. He made his Broadway debut in 1959. He has always been in demand as a character actor, including films such as Porkchop Hill, 1959, Payday, 1973, Songwriter, 1984, with Willie Nelson and Chris Christopherson. Uh, asshole? Summer Rental, 1985, Defending Your Life, 1991, Men in Black, 1997, Men in Black 2, 2002, Dodgeball, a true underdog story, and Men in Black 3, 2012. Oh yeah, Sissy Spacek is his cousin. Yehai Ding played Colonel Kim in this movie, Wo Fat in the original 5-0, and Dr. Yin Lo in the Manchurian Candidate, 1962. But he was born Kenneth Dickerson in New Jersey. Shocking. He was of Egyptian Sudanese ancestry and is noted for playing Asian roles. I guess that's why they call it acting. Story. The movie begins in a Korean POW camp. The men are searched and one that has a knife is shot while attempting to escape. It then switches to the 1st Army headquarters in New York. Colonel William Edwards, Richard Widmark, is heading to the office. Back at the office, a nervous Lieutenant George Miller, Rip Torn, a nosy Sergeant Baker, Martin Balsam, and the best-looking corporal in the Army, Corporal Gene Evans, Dolores Michaels, are waiting. Sergeant Baker mentions to Lieutenant Miller that he and the Colonel were in the Battle of the Bulge together, and they are both wearing the 1st Division combat patch, the Big Red One. Very soon I will review the Battle of the Bulge, 1965, a fictionalized version of the 101st Airborne in the Bulge, and the Big Red One, 1980, a really fictionalized version of the division in World War II. When Edwards gets back, Corporal Evans tells him that the general is looking for him. He meets Lieutenant General Jay Connors, Carl Benton Reed, who is only interested in bringing the current investigation to an end. The way this general pushes for the report is very similar to General Hirschberg, Michael Moriarty, pushed Lieutenant Colonel Nathaniel Nate Serling, Denzel Washington, to submit the report on Captain Karen Emma Walden, Meg Ryan's Medal of Honor recommendation in Courage Under Fire, 1996. Edwards returns and continues his interview with Lieutenant Miller, who is a very reluctant witness. 
as Miller tells the tale, they go back to the POW camp. Prisoners are waiting in the compound for Korean Colonel Kim, K. Hai Ding, and the ranking American Major Harry Cargill, Richard Basehart, to return from a torture session. When Kim starts the communist lecture, the POWs resist with coughs. Then Major Cargill is pulled from the back of the truck and begins speaking the same communist propaganda. Communism is... <laughs> Comrade Cargill, last is yours. For our first session, we'll approach the subject from a historical point of view. When Kim leaves, the POWs see that Cargill is not just acting, he is broken. The interview continues with Lieutenant Miller telling how two men died of dysentery before Major Cargo broke. General Connors comes in to talk to Lieutenant Miller, and we find out that the General's son died in the same POW camp. The General takes the witness away for drinks and to talk about his son. Colonel Edwards is still concerned because Major Cargill had a stellar record until he broke and became a collaborator. Cargill also refuses to defend himself. Cargill shows up for his interview and is very resentful and unhelpful. You the same Major Harry Cargill who was imprisoned in Camp GG in Korea? Yes, sir. You were captured during the breakthrough along the Alu River in North Korea? Yes, sir. You were hospitalized for two months and you were transferred to this Camp GG. That's right. I have a statement here confessing to germ warfare which supposedly carries your signature. It's my signature. Well, look at it first, Major. Edwards plays a newsreel that Cargill recorded and Cargill freaks out. The next morning, Edwards goes to see Mrs. Cargill, June Lockhart. Mrs. Cargill tells Edwards that they haven't had sex since he came back. When Edwards returns to base, Major Cargill is waiting. Edwards keys in on the phrase that Colonel Kim is serious now. Corporal Evans notes similarities in the testimony of the POWs concerning the death of the two men in the camp. They all use very similar phrases in describing the disease and its consequences, like Bacillary dysentery and dehydration. Well, that's you know, only natural. They didn't have any doctors. They had to be familiar with all kinds of repetitive wordage. Shades of the Manchurian Candidate, or as I first learned about it on WKRP in Cincinnati, Season 3, Episode 3, where everyone that is interviewed about Herb says he is, quote, hard worker, loyal husband, and all-around fine person, unquote. In this movie, they use phrases like, he died following an acute case of dysentery and bacillary dysentery and dehydration. In the 48 hours before Cargill broke, two men died. Lieutenant Harvey died following an acute case of dysentery. And Captain Connors? Same thing. You see, sir, in cases of bacillary dysentery, the incidence of death is pretty high, especially when there's no medicine. See, what happens is dehydration sets in and the, the sick man suffers from a general wasting away and then just dies. The general busts in and questions Edwards about seeing Cargill's wife and the time the investigation is taking. The general tells a story that he heard in the bar from Miller that contradicts Miller's testimony. Oh, I'm terribly sorry I hurt your feelings, Baker. Now, what do you want? I'm just trying to suggest, sir, that this case is so open and shut we don't even need a court-martial. Oh, I see. Look, sir, all we have to do is take a card punch holes in it, one for each wrong thing this Major Cargill did, send it through an IBM machine and come up with the right answer. That's the kind of case this is. So? This is a hot potato, sir. Baker, what? is there anything else on your mind? Yes, sir. As Just long as you're asking yes me. or no, anything else on your mind. Yes, sir. Then shut right. up. Sergeant Baker takes Major Cargill into the office and tries to convince him to confess or kill himself so Colonel Edwards will not get in trouble. Now, if you'd like my suggestion, get a heart attack. Get run over. Get... Lost. Get something. That's what you can do, sir. Cargill explains to the corporal that no man can stand an unlimited amount of pressure. Edwards returns and continues the interrogation. Edwards and Cargill argue, and Cargill leaves. He brings in Lieutenant Miller and begins trapping him in lies. They bring Cargill back in with Baker and Evans. Miller breaks down, and he blurts out that Cargill must have told what really happened. The scene goes back to the camp where they are drawing lots to kill a man. Cargill does not go along, but it is agreed no one will talk. Miller gets the marked stick, and when the general's son comes in, they accuse him of betraying the man with the knife that was shot by the North Korean. Miller does the killing. It turns out that after seeing the men turn on each other, and Colonel Kim saying he will kill all of the men in the camp, Cargill flips to save them. Miller freaks out, thinking he is going to be charged with murder. 
Nancy. They're going to try me for murder. Oh, I'm, I'm not the only one. We we're all in it together. The general finds out that his son broke, and him and Cargill get into a debate. But the general holds the line. Traitors are traitors. Cargill says a man has a time limit, and the general says they have a wider responsibility. Then I'll be damned if I'll stand here and allow you to attack a code that better men than you have lived and died by. The code? The co How much does the code ask of a man? Everything. If a man's a soldier, no man's exempt. Not this man. Not my son, Noah. Edwards recommends no trial, but the general has the final word. Edwards asks to defend Cargill. So, are all of your strong days washed away by one weekday? Just one sheep. World famous short summary, a remake of The Manchurian Candidate, 1962, five years prior. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Remember, you can find all of the links at snarkymoviereviews.com, and I appreciate those reviews in iTunes.